Welcome back. Today we're going to talk about xenophanies and we're going to talk about Heraclitus continuing to move through. It's hot out there, right? I'm, like, I'm sweating. It's ridiculous. Sorry um, about the sweatiness. Continue working our way through the pre-Socratics. What have we done so far? Who have we covered? Help me out here because I'm old and addled. I can't remember things. Thales, and say it again for me. Anaximenes, thank you. It's a difficult one. Thales, Anaximenes, Anaximander, Anaximenes, Anaximander, and then Pythagoras. Pythagoras gets put in a different category by Baird, but I, I mean, they're kind of like almost accidental categories. A lot of it's kind of geographic or like who folks were working with. He lumps all three of these fellas together and puts them in the same group. They're all called together what? Milesians. Yeah, pre-Socratics, but everybody before Socrates is a pre-Socratic. These three in particular are Milesians. the Milesians. Yeah, Milesians. Why do we call them the Milesians? Because they're from Miletus. Because they're all from Miletus, yeah. It's a little town. Go back to the map again. To the Black Sea, that way. And Sicily down there, and then Northern Africa here. So they're all from Miletus, which is somewhere around about here. All from Miletus. Another thing that supposedly groups them all together is the, the everything is one yeah, the everything is one something, and that one something for all the Milesians seems to be materialistic, but with one possible nagging exception, and that's Epirian. an accident. You guys are all over this. If your mumbling is exactly what I thought you said. <laughs> Yeah, Anaximander seems to maybe be somebody who sticks out a little bit. The Milesians are all regarded typically as material monists. Where the monist part just means everything is one thing, there's only one kind of thing, and the material part is that that one thing is a material sort of thing. That just started, right? That's not me. Pythagoras, definitely not a materialist, right? Soul. He believes in a soul. Believes in a soul, and that that soul is immortal. immortal and distinctly not bodily, right? Not material. So believes that a soul exists, that it's immortal because it's not a material thing, and furthermore, that that's the, that's the real you. Your body is just like a prison for your soul, and then when you die, your soul is released from the prison. We'll see a lot of that language again in Plato. Everything is mathematical. mathematical ratios, which brings in a couple of interesting aspects. We have this whole idea of mathematical ratio. And that's not just in a kind of like a scientific sense that we might think of it today. In fact, this is, this is a pretty standard position, I think, for a lot of a lot of physicists today is this idea. The world is really made of mathematical ratios. If you like dig deep enough, like, well, what's, you know, what's stuff made out of? Atoms. What are atoms made of? Yeah, like protons, neutrons, electrons. What are they made out of? Well, the protons and neutrons are made of quarks. You go deep enough, what do we got? Vibrating strings? How different is that than what Pythagoras is talking about. We have mathematical ratio, particularly as expressed through music. So we have an idea of harmony, and that brings in notions of beauty. And even though Pythagoras and the Pythagoreans don't go there right away, possibility of something like justice. And again, Plato's going to pick these sorts of things up too and run really, really big with them. Is it clear that mathematical ratios are abstract things and definitely not material? Yeah. 
is it clear that mathematical ratios or numerical ratios are abstract things and not material? And you might just kind of stop for a moment and ask yourself, like, whoa, what is, like, let's take a mathematical ratio. The double, right? Two. This is two times greater than this other thing. What is, what is the double? Is there, like, can I, can I find it anywhere? Can I see it with my eyes? Can you hear it with your ears? You can, examples, right? But two, the number two itself, what is that? Yeah, an abstract thing, right? What is a number? If you really want to keep yourself up late at night, <laughs> when you're like, what's a number exactly? What is the number two? Is there just one number two? Where is it? Does it, like, does it have a where? What's going on with these mathematical ratios? This is what Pythagoras and Pythagoreans are directing us towards. So we've got a movement in the direction of the abstract that's way more pronounced than even we saw with an axiomander. It's a little island off the coast here near Miletus called Samos. And Her uh, Pythagoras starts off here close to My Miletus and the Milesians, but eventually moves with his cult to over here on the inside of the boot of Italy, to Croton. OK. That's where Pythagoras and the Pythagoreans are. You've heard of Pythagoras, right? Yeah. Before, before the last time we talked? Where did you hear about him from? Pythagorean theorem. The, 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 famous, the famous Pythagorean theorem, which we all know. A squared plus B squared. Yeah, for any right triangle, if I label the largest side C and the other one's A and B, A squared plus B squared equals C squared. It, it works every single time. It's really remarkable. And all it really means is if I make a square out of this and I make a square out of this and I add up the areas of these two squares, it's going to be the same as the area of this big square. That's my Pythagorean theorem. And it works every single time. That's actually pretty remarkable. Another thing that's kind of remarkable is this thing that Pythagoras and the Pythagoreans are probably the most famous for this Pythagorean theorem is actually like a no one's really sure how true any of this is or what's apocryphal what's just myth what actually happened but this pr represents a really serious problem for Pythagoras and the Pythagoreans most of the time this works out all right if this side is three yeah I did it right if this side is three and this side is four what's that side gonna be that's, that's nice. Everything works out in whole number, nice whole number ratios, right? If this side is 1 and this side is 1, what's this side? The square root of 2. What the hell is the square root of 2? Blah, 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 blah. The blah, 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 blah part is like really, really important. It goes on and on forever. There is no whole number ratio that represents the square root of 2. It is what is known as a, what do we call it? Mm, well, radical, the radical is the little, it is an irrational number, an irra mathematical ratios, that makes up everything. The thing that Pythagoras and the Pythagoreans most famous for today, the Pythagorean theorem, exposes the possibility of irrational ratios. Does that even make sense? Irrational ratios, irrational numbers that are not whole number ratios of one another. As legend has it, and this is the part that I'm like, I'm not sure if this is true or like what's going on with this, but as legend has it, the first Pythagorean who discovered this and was like, uh, not a tidy whole number ratio here. They took him out to sea and tossed him and they like, they drowned him basically. They were like, no, we can't have any of that. Out to sea with you and over the edge of the boat. <clears throat> this would be a huge big deal if you were like, oh, everything is in nice like, whole number ratios. All the beautiful things are in nice whole number ratios, except triangles, possibly the most basic of the geometric shapes, which give us what the Greeks would call alogon scenarios, right? That these things, that they don't talk to one another, that there is no tidy whole number ratio. It's a problem for them. Where's my eraser? Far away. <clears throat> All right, so that's Pythagoras and the Pythagoreans. Any questions on what we've covered so far? Baird gives us a chapter called Three Solitary Figures, the first of which is Pythagoras. Second? 
Yeah, oh, you started it. That was very bold. What is it? Xenophanies. Yeah, Xenophanies. One of the interesting things about Xenophanes is that he's taking like a slightly different tack on exactly what this philosophical project might be. He's not doing the same sort of thing as everybody else. So far, everybody else is kind of neatly kind of categorizable, ooh, with the possible exception of an accent man or not fitting with the rest of the Milesians. Um, but everybody's doing this thing where they say everything is this one thing, some kind of monistic RK. Xenophanes isn't opposed to this idea of a monistic RK, but he's not out to say, like, here's what it is. Xenophanes is just talking about God. That's all he's doing. He's just talking about God. And furthermore, he introduces a little bit of a, a, little bit of a meta cognitive moment, a little, a little moment of reflection. whereby he's not necessarily telling you what the truth is. He's pointing out how it is that you come to your beliefs and pointing out that mm, it's maybe not that reliable. The way that he does it is by pointing out that like, hey, you ever notice that everybody's gods look just like them? When you go to Africa, the Ethiopian gods, they all look like the Ethiopians. You go up to Thrace, they look like the Thracians. Red hair, blue eyes. Down in Ethiopia, dark skin, flatter noses. This is surprising, I guess? I don't know. Is it silly that we make gods in our own image? Yes. Good thing we're way past that today, right? Uh, like nobody, uh, nobody makes gods in their own image anymore. When we think of, I mean, honestly, though, when we do, like, even those amongst us who are religious, even those amongst us who aren't, when you think of God, what do you think? Do you think of somebody who looks, looks at least a little bit like a person? No. Some of us have like way more expansive ideas of God. The white people, they have their white Jesus. And we all know that like there's no way Jesus was white. <laughs> Xenophanes goes on to point out that like, you know what? If cows and lions and zebras, if like all the animals, if they had gods too, if they were able to like tell us what their gods were like or draw pictures of their gods, guess what the cow god would look like? It, yeah, it'd be a cow and the lion god would be a lion. So uh, maybe a mistake here to try to create God in your image. We're not like quite to the point where we're, the Greeks at least aren't talking about man being created in God's image, which would be the reverse. We have this in, a, in a, a monotheistic tradition of man being created or humans being created in God's image. Xenophanes is pointing out that, like, in fact, we tend to do the opposite. We create our own gods in our own image, which is almost certainly mistaken. Why is it almost? Do we need an argument? Does Xenophanes even offer an argument? Why would it be mistaken? Yeah. Yeah, so there's only, he says, there's only one God. How can it look different to everybody if there's only one God? Or how could there actually be, how could there be like a white people God and a black people God and a cow God and a lion God? Like there's too many gods. We need to like not have quite so many gods. Just one God, only one God. And it's a mistake to think that it looks just like you. There are some other hands. Yes. Yes, some religions do say that we've been made in God's image, which is, in fact, the opposite of us making God in our own image, right? Yeah. yeah. The Greeks aren't quite hip to this idea of like humans being created in God's image. It's not a very popular idea in their theology. But, yeah, we can at least we can identify that like the reverse is a popular idea amongst religions today. And Xenophanes is pointing out that, like, no, 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 at the, like, you're doing it backwards. He says nothing at all about whether or not humans are created in God's image. In fact, he seems to be suggesting that perhaps not. Only one God. Perhaps an appealing idea to us today, who maybe tend a little towards monotheism rather than polytheism. He's not the first monotheist, by the way. Zoroaster is on the scene. I'm guessing here. 
I think somewhere around 100 years earlier. Somewhere in that neighborhood. Not long before, but definitely before. There's, it's, not, it's not like a photo finish. Zoroaster gets there before Xenophanes does. But Xenophanes is offering us a, this little moment where it's, look at the way that you invent your gods, and isn't it a silly way to invent gods? It's a criticism of the way that we form our beliefs, our theological beliefs, and not necessarily a big, huge argument for a positive thesis. He does offer the positive thesis that there's only one God. What else does he say about it? If there's only one God, what's it like? Is it the cow God? Is it the Thracian God? Is it the Ethiopian God? Whose God is the one true God? We don't know. Yeah? He says it's beyond our There is only one God, and that God is beyond our understanding. Now, this move towards monotheism is a similar sort of thing that we've kind of been seeing before, only instead of working out in a kind of a materialistic, mechanistic context, or maybe even some kind of abstract RK or abstract governing fundamental principle, we have a theological one now. And notice it's this movement from like a many. And the problem that you have with the many, with many different gods, is if they're not all the same, they might disagree, right? Now we have this problem of like, well, what do we do when some gods want it this way, some gods want it a different way, then the gods fight, mm, now we got to wait and see. And this is, this is like, you read the Iliad, this is, this is the Greek theology, right? That's how it's working. And Xenophanes is saying, no, 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 way simpler if it's just one god. It's an expansive idea, it's beyond our comprehension. So not only do we get this metaphysical moment, not only do we get a movement towards monotheism, monotheism that's kind of consistent with this movement towards monism in general, whether it's a material monistic principle or an abstract mathematical monistic principle. Here we have a monistic theological principle. And we get this articulation for the first time that we've kind of like been wandering through this pre-Socratic wilderness. We get an articulation of skepticism. That, like, here's the truth. The world is really just one way, governed by a single fundamental theological RK. We'll call it God, because why not? That seems a handy word. What's that God like? No idea. Definitely not what anybody thinks of it. We all get it wrong. Except for me, I suppose, right now, when I'm saying there is just one God. So this is, we're in, like, similar territory again here. There's only one God, and that God is beyond my understanding. Have I understood God? Is that God's nature? And maybe like we'll say, like, that's the best you can do? Yeah. And by saying there's one God, at least he understands a little bit about it. Yeah, he's got a little something, right? There's only one. Uh, oh, all right, oh, what else about it? Well, he's completely beyond our, oh, completely xenophanies? You know there's one. You know that he's completely beyond your understanding. You understand a little bit, I suppose. Is that enough? We'll see this again in just a second. We get an articulation of skepticism and this continuation of a monistic streak. Questions about Xenophanes? It's only like a page and a half in Baird on him. There's only so much we can say. We only have a couple of fragments. And the movement towards monotheism is one that my impression is most people today are like, yawn, I've known that since Sunday school. What was the thing where you talked about the last class period where you're just like, you understand that it's like, you understand that you can't understand something, something like that. Hold on a second. Let's get you a microphone. Can you catch? Yep, you can. You can do it. There it is. All right. So ask your question again one more time for the people at home. It's on. You don't have to do anything. Hello? You don't have to talk directly into it. Just hold it near you. I want to be like a spokesperson. Okay, you can, but it's going to be super hella loud. <laughs> can you hear me? I, it's being recorded on the I don't think tablet. I'm pressing the right button. Don't press any buttons. Just talk. Oh, hello? Actually, you mind if I take a look real quick to see if you turned it off? I, no, it's on. The light's it's on. on. Two green lights? No, a no. green light and a red light. Oh. Recording? Oh, crap balls. Uh, yeah, hold on, that's all, it's all right. No, no need for crap balls. <laughs> I think I broke it. It's possible you broke it. All right, go for it. Just talking to it. Can you hear me? Yep, I can hear you. Go Sweet. ahead. 
Uh, the thing we were talking about last class period where uh, I don't know your name um, all the way down the table where you were. Stanton. Stanley? Stanton. Stanton. Oh, yeah. Basically what he said is like you, uh, it, he's like beyond our understanding. You understand that he's beyond your understanding. Something like that. Where it just is kinda, that understanding? Kind of makes it, in a way. Uh, Which way? It kind of goes in a circle, actually. A little bit, maybe, yeah. But yeah. it's like it seems kind of like null and void, though, to to understand that it's beyond your understanding. Is that truly understanding? Yeah. In fact, we might even say that like to understand that something is beyond your understanding is not really understanding, or at least is some, or maybe it reveals the that the notion of trying to understand the ununderstandable is yeah. itself ununderstandable. Yeah. Let me say that one more time. The attempt to try to understand the ununderstandable is, is itself that a word? ununderstandable. Which would be just fine. Z, like, well, like the whole time that we're sitting understand. here talking, we would imagine Xenophanes might be patiently sitting on the side and being like, yes, yes, <laughs> exactly. That's what I'm saying. You can't understand it. We're like, and yeah, he might be like, ah, you get it. And we'd be like, I don't get it. And he's like, that. Then you definitely get it. <laughs> it's a deconstructive moment, right? In fact, it's, it's like remarkably similar to what a lot of like deconstructive philosophy looks like today. It says, like, here's how you came to the belief. It's not a, like when we expose how it is that these beliefs in many gods or the gods that resemble ourselves, when we expose how those come to be, it doesn't look very pretty. It doesn't look like a very attractive way to form your belief. And then beyond that, we just say, we just, explo we just blow everything else up and say, it's, it's not understandable. It is fundamentally ununderstandable. And it's the fundamental RK of all that is. So basically, the world itself, like, good luck, you're not going to understand it. Yeah. Is this kind of where, does this, this kind of influence Socrates' ideal of after like a dialogue where he wants to go, like, oh, I don't understand it anymore, now I want to learn more. Yeah, so. When we, get to, when we get to especially early Platonic dialogues and we see this move over and over again, it's all very easy, I think, for a lot of folks to read Plato and say, oh, he's saying a very similar thing to Xenophanes. Well, the only thing that I know is that I know nothing or something like this, right? Is it like an influence? Yeah, well, it would certainly be an influence. This is one of the reasons why we study the pre-Socratics, because they influence the folks that, that come later. Although, when we get to it, I'll, I'll point out that I'm not sure if this is an articulation of skepticism on the part of Socrates and Plato. It might just be one necessary moment in like trying to come to the truth. First thing you do is you realize that you don't know what you thought you knew. Now you're ready to learn something. Okay. That's Xenophanes. Any questions? All right. Which means we have a little less than an hour to talk about my man, Heraclitus. What a fascinating figure Heraclitus is. Second only, maybe, amongst the pre-Socratics to possibly Parmenides, who we're going to read like immediately after. Heraclitus sometimes referred to as the dark philosopher for a couple of reasons. One, um, he was, by most accounts, kind of a nasty guy. He would look at other, other like all of the stupid hoi polloi, and just be like, ugh, ugh, what's their problem? Also sometimes called the dark philosopher because he speaks in riddles. There's something obscure about, about the things that he says. Um, according to an account from Diog Diogenes Laertius, um, when Socrates was first given the works of Heraclitus, Somebody asked him, like, what do you think, Socrates? And Socrates was like, the parts that I understood were excellent. And I think the parts that I didn't understand were also excellent, probably. But it would, it would take a Delian diver to get down to the bottom of it. <clears throat> Heraclitus the Obscure. Heraclitus the Dark Philosopher. Let's see if we can shine a little bit of light on him. I think there are three ideas. You got a, you got a whole mess of fragments there from Baird, right? Just like all kinds of stuff. Like Heraclitus said this, and this, and this, and this. They're grouped loosely into things. But it's, it's a mishmash, right? Like how do we make sense of something like this? 
especially because some of the fragments themselves seem to be at odds with themselves. We'll, we'll look at this. Um, uh, da, 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 three big ideas for Heraclitus that I think are important to try to get a sense of what it is that he's getting at. The first of these three big ideas is everything, everything, everything is, everything is. Oh, you're jumping ahead like a bunch of little bunnies. Everything is in a state of constant change. In fact, I'm not even going to say a state of constant change, because that sounds like it's a state, right? Something consistent. In constant change, or flux sometimes. Everything is in constant change or flux. Now we'll get and now we'll say everything is in ever living fire. And he says everything that ever was, everything that is, everything that ever will be is in ever living fire. And then last but not least, war, sometimes strife is how we'll, we'll translate that, is the father of all things and the king of all things. Let's start with everything is in constant change or flux. We actually get a fragment from Heraclitus that um, illustrates this and actually is a saying that's relatively common today. Have you ever heard anybody say something like, you can't step into the same river twice? No, never heard it? Well, I, you've heard it now. You can't step into the same river twice. What the hell does that mean? If you can step into the river once, presumably you can step right out and step back in again a second time. It's not the same river. Why isn't it the same river? Ah, because the water is moving, right? It was one river when you stepped in it the first time. Now it's a completely different river because the water is flowing. Want to go one step deeper? It's not just that the river's been changing between the first and the second time, so it's not the same river that you stepped in. You're not the same between the first and the second time. You've constantly been changing in the process, too. So you can't step into the same river twice. You stepped in it once, and you step back out. Now the river's different, and you're different. You're not the same person. The river's not the same river. You can't step in the same river twice. Everything is in a constant state of flux and change. Nothing remains the same. It is always changing. We might say, perhaps paradoxically, another, another phrase that is relatively common in today's parlance, the only constant is change. Yeah, the only constant is change. The only constant is change. Let's think about this for just a moment, because that's kind of like one of those things you'd be like, oh, that's interesting. Like, like is, is he right? Does that make any sense? And what are some of the consequences of thinking this? You can't step into the same river twice. Everything is in constant state of flux. The only constant is change. Can I make any sense of this at all? Can I make any sense of this at all? Can I make any sense? this at all? No, it doesn't get any clearer. No, can I... In order for there to be change, doesn't something have to remain the same? If I was like, have you changed? Don't you have to be the same person at like T1 and T2 in order to say you changed? Is it possible to say that nothing changes? Must something subsist underneath the change to make it a change? That's Parmenides. We'll get to it. Yeah, not not yet, not yet. But wait, uh, let's. Well, wait, wait. What do you say? It's like the principle where like A can't be A and then A apostrophe at the same time. Okay, so something can't be itself and something other than itself at the same time. Yeah. Like A has to be A. A has to be A. And it can't be not A. So as soon as A becomes not A, it's not A, which is to say not A but not A. So now it's a completely different thing. Did it change? 
There's no it. There's no constant it to say that it changed. What supports the change? Or are we talking about a radical source? So like, right off the bat, we can see if Heraclitus is serious about this idea that everything is in a constant of flux, the only constant is change. If he's serious about this, then it is a radical conception of change, one that we typically don't think of. Usually when we think of change, we think of some consistent thing, like persisted throughout the change, that's why we all, that's why we attach the change to the one thing and say, it changed. But if there's no it, if that it evaporates as soon as the change happens, then I, like, what kind, this is a different sort of change, a radical sort of change, yeah. That is eternal and never changes? Yeah. Everything is in a constant state of flux and change. No forms. No, no eternal form of the thing that never changes. Everything is changing. This is, yeah, this is, you, you're starting to get the sense of like, oh, that is a really big idea. Yes? It's like thinking about a river, but not the exact thing that you're talking about, but like the river is, it, there's no like, you can't just stop the river and then point right there and be like, that's going to change in a second. Constantly it's constantly it's going, right? Yeah. Yeah. It's only exist in a moment, right? Yeah. They uh, no no it no thing lasts longer than a moment in time. As soon as that moment has passed, at the very least, now it's the thing at t two instead of t one. It changed, so it's a different thing now. Yes. Nope. Well, you do. There, it's gone, yeah. You have a self, and now there's a new you with a new self. New you with a new self. It's actually much faster than that, but yeah. What? Why even refer to a self then? Oh, well, we're wrong. We're just completely wrong to do that, yeah. Yeah, Her yeah if somebody was like, all right, Heraclitus, then what's up with like me and myself? And like, I, it was me when I was five years old and I had the roller skating birthday party, and it was me when... I farted real loud during that test in high school, and it was me when I defended my dissertation, and it's me right now. It's all the same me. Heraclitus would be like, bullshit. It's not, it's not you. It's not all the same you. It's a different person from moment to moment. We have this incredible explosion of things such that, like, instead of saying, like, oh, there's a bunch of, like, before we were saying, like, there's one thing. Everything is one thing. And now suddenly, like, well, everything is, oh, I didn't say everything is. I did say everything is, but I'm not saying everything is just one thing. I'm saying everything has one characteristic that perfuses through all things, which is that they're all in a constant state of flux or change, which means all of the things never last longer than a moment. Yes? Um, so I'm jumping ahead a little bit, but I kind of see it like fire. A uh, fire is a completely different thing at every moment, yeah. but it's still. Yeah, except that we might say, like, only, only in a manner of speaking. Heraclitus would say, like, uh, if it's really in constant change, then it's a brand new fire from moment to moment. So maybe this is something that we're going to take seriously. Maybe we'll, we'll try to figure Actually, this is going to end up being a serious riddle, how we figure out, like, how, how do we think of, like, consistency <coughs> through change? How do we think of change at all? This is Aristotle's big question. is like, how are we supposed to think about change? We're going to see it from Plato as well in the, um, in the dialogue Parmenides, where a young Socrates finds himself caught in between Heraclitus on one side and Parmenides on the other side. And he's trying to stay in between, but it seems like he can't, he can't find a middle path. He's either like sliding off to Heraclitus or he's sliding off to Parmenides. We have a whole lot of things. In fact, we might say like an infinite continuum of things. Suddenly, instead of just like one thing that undergirds everything, now that we've got this principle of flux that Heraclitus is directing us towards, which is totally an, like the Pythagoreans, and maybe I guess kind of like Xenophanes as well, we're talking about an abstract RK now, right? Change. It's a principle. It's not, it's not like water or air or even the aperon. I'm not even sure if it's quite the same sort of thing as mathematical ratio. It's a principle. Let's move on to, yeah, fire. Everything is in ever-living fire. If we can think of this in a way that's consistent with this idea that everything is in a constant state of flux, I think we're on our way to starting to understand what Heraclitus was trying to get at. Yes? Um, did he purposely um, suggest fire because um, usually things in open, for things to change, 
some sort of heat must be added on to it? So, yeah, we might wonder, yeah, so like why fire, right? We've heard water before, we've heard air before. Poor earth left out in the cold. Nobody thinks earth is the fundamental archaic of all things. Now we get fire from Heraclitus, which is way, way different. Before we had everything is in a constant state of change or flux, we had a, we had a very abstract principle, the principle of change. Now it seems like we're back to the material monus again, right? Everything is fire. Unless we think of fire as some sort of metaphor, right? One of the things that we notice about fire, it's constantly changing. Fire never stands still. It can't stand still. There's no such thing as like a fire. If you're like down to take a picture of a fire and you're like, wait, wait, hold on, like stay still, like smile. Like fire, fire don't do that. It's constantly moving and changing. Not only that, fire seems like it's of all the elements. And we're dealing with like the four classical elements here, right? Not like the periodic table of elements. That's not going to be for a long, long time. But earth, air, fire, water, those are the big four. No heart for all the Captain Planet fans out there. <laughs> fire of all of those seems the most like it's alive. Remember we were saying like Thales, Thales might have been onto something. Life always happens when there's water around. Yeah, but fire is alive. Is alive? Seems alive does the same things as like living things do. It's also like, oh, it's up there in the sky and it like kind of, I don't, I don't know if there is any life without the big fire in the sky. It's up in the clouds too, there's lightning, more fire in the sky. Yeah, fire, it's always moving, it's always changing. But we're not talking about this in the sense of a, maybe, or at least I'll, I'll suggest, that we not think of this in the sense of a material monism. Maybe we think of it in terms of a metaphor. What else is going on with fire? Tell me, tell me more. How, like, how does fire work? Where does fire come from? Yes. Stuff? Yeah, it's a chemical reaction. And what, like, what, what, what goes, what's on the left side of that arrow in that chemical reaction? Fuel, right? Fuel. Fire comes from fuel. What happens to the fuel in the process of fire coming from fuel? It changes. Yeah, it gets destroyed, in fact, right? Everything that causes fire to get, like, everything, like, fire comes from stuff, and it destroys exactly what it comes from. Think of this in terms also of everything is in a constant state of flux or change. To change... You come from one particular state, and you must destroy it in order to enter into this new state. This is why I would hazard, I'm, not, I'm no psychologist, but I would imagine, this is why change is very, very difficult for a lot of people and kind of a scary thing. You have to destroy your old self in order to become a new self. Just like fire does. What it comes from, it destroys. Yes? Uh, I, was, I was thinking of actually something different. It was... Uh... In some cultures, they see fire as like life, or the life giver. Uh, so perhaps he was the reason he used fire is to in showing it was telling about how ever so changing it is. Maybe he's referring to life itself being like a fire that's changing all the time, like a fire. Right? Not exactly a fire, though. Right? Hmm. I, this is the this is like the key question. Is Heraclitus just another material monist? Or is he saying, eh, the phrasing here is everything is in ever-living fire, not everything is, is fire, right? So we can parse the phrasing uh, like ever so preciously. But also we can look at the rest of his fragments and ask ourselves, does he seem like a material monist? Does he seem like the Milesians and other material monists? Is he putting forth fire as an arcade the same way that Thales put water forth as an arcade? Or is he doing something slightly different? Is he using it, in fact, as a metaphor instead? Yes? I kind of love the controlled wildfires. Mm. Because they use the great new cadet group in forests. Yeah. There is no creation without destruction, right. in fact, we might say. Yeah, no such thing in the natural world or in the artifactual world either, right? No creation without destruction. This is the beginning, and we started to see a little hint of it before when we were talking about Anaximander. 
We've got some riddles that are starting to work their way into our conversation regarding coming to be and perishing. That this is a particular kind of a, like a strange thing to try to give an account, a logos, uh, of, of what's going on with coming to be and perishing. Because this does seem to be how the natural world works, right? The natural world is itself change. The natural world is not some like constantly, is that, does that seem right at least? When you look around at the world, is it holding steady in one state or is it constantly moving and doing stuff? That's how it seems, at least, right? And that's a metaphysical riddle. How are we to think our way through this? Everything is in a constant state of flux. You can't even step in the same river twice. And everything is in ever-living fire. And we have a hand in the back, and then we'll move on to strife and war. Yep. Yeah, there are no atomists yet. Feels smooth, right? Yeah. Yeah, like there's no change in elevation on the table. But get close enough and sure enough, yeah. As a matter of fact, right now we look at the table and it looks like the table's staying still. You get real close, well, there's a lot of activity in there. Nothing is staying still. Particularly if we define temperature as motion, right? If we define temperature as the kinetic energy of the particles in a system, then yeah, every time something is moving, there's heat. Yeah. Yeah, except that's not quite as illustrative as fire is, right? Because when you say everything is in ever living energy, then I don't get all these pictures of consumption and destruction in the process. I also, when I think of energy, I don't think of like something dancing like it's alive and like not able to stay put. Yeah. Energy can be created nor destroyed, right? Yeah. It, and sometimes it can stay steady, too. Like, we might say, like, if I hoist something up, like, really, really high and I keep it there, I've stored some potential energy, and that energy is just hanging out for a little while. Yep. Yeah, but there are a lot of things that are comprised of energy. So if those things die out, where does that energy go? Someplace else. <laughs> it changes into a new form where new things are born and come into being. And in order for that to happen, old things had to perish. And it's constant. Coming to be, perish. Coming into being, perish. Coming in, going out. In, out, in, out, in, like constantly. In and out, in, in and out, in and out. Nothing stays in being for more than a moment. War, strife, father or the king of all things. This one's a little more difficult. Yeah. Kind of remind me of dialectical Yeah. Whoa, yeah. Uh, so, like, Her so one comment here about Heraclitus, like a lot of the, the pre-Socratics that we look at, a lot of times folks will only study them in an ancient philosophy class. They'll only study them in relation to other later ancient figures like Plato, Socrates, Aristotle, these folks. Heraclitus is a possible exception of somebody who's been hugely influential even in relatively contemporary times. He was hugely influential on Hegel. Hegel was like a really big, so not so much Marx, but by way of Hegel to Marx, um, this idea of dialectics. And we'll look at that in just a second. It's like the style of the way that he's like making his arguments, if we want to call him that. Nietzsche also heavily influenced by Heraclitus. And you might get that sense, too, if you read Nietzsche and, and see. He has this very aphoristic style, same as Heraclitus does. Speaking in riddles, same as Heraclitus does. Um, when I was in grad school, I saw two doctoral dissertations on Heraclitus happen while I was there, which is like surprising for somebody who's been dead for so, so long and has so little material to go on, right? Like everything that you have in your book there under Heraclitus, that's all anybody has on Heraclitus. That's all the Heraclitus there is. Well, I suppose it might, you know, oh, wait, tragic that we don't have more from Heraclitus? Yeah, well, you know. Maybe that'll motivate you to write shit down. <laughs> War and strife. It's the father and the king of all things. Uh, well, we already have some sense of this if we just refer it back to the fire analogy or the fire metaphor, right? Where, does, where do things come from? Where does creation come from? 
Destruction. Destruction, yeah. Creation has to come from destruction. So yeah, war and strife. It's going to be the father and the king of all things. Another way to look at this too might be to say where things do appear to be holding steady, where things seem to be like able to persist over time. What's going on? If we say that everything is in a constant state of flux, well then from whence the, you know, perhaps we want to call it an illusion, from whence cometh the seeming that sometimes things will hang out for a little while and not change? Like for instance, now. I am changing? That's true. Maybe I am. Yeah, maybe this is like zoom in really, really close and you'll see that there's a whole lot of activity. Or even when we see things like, in fact, it's necessary in order things, for things to come to a stop. We might say there needs to be an opposition of forces. If everything is in a constant state of change in order for things to like slow down and hold steady for just a moment, we need something like war or strife, some kind of dynamic equilibrium, right? Where we see like things are still changing, but they're changing or they're pushing up against each other in such a way that like if anything is going to stick around even for a little while, if that is an idea that makes any sense at all, it's because of the opposition of forces. So because of some kind of like war or strife. That's one way to think about it. Another way to think about it is just as an extension of the fire metaphor, creation must necessarily come from destruction, namely destruction of the past states of the things that are being created. Yeah. So it could also be a matter of like the size and scale of the change. Like if you're just standing still, quote unquote, I mean your body is still like your blood's moving, you're breathing, so you're still changing, but it's on a small scale. Or it could be like over the course of a war, like sure there's a war going on, it's the same war that's been going on, but it's changed on a on a, a larger scale. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's that's probably true. So yeah, there's a there's a question of scale and scope, right? That's going to make make things look different, which would be disturbing, right? If we're talking about like here's the way the the world really is, and apparently it depends on our viewpoint, how close up or how far away we are. That doesn't sound like how it really is, right? What's the more really real of the table, the micro scale version of the table? or this macro or meso scale version of the table. The table as it seems to me, or the table under a microscope. Which one's the real? There's just one table? Yeah, it's just everything about the table is the table. Is the table? Like the Both how it seems and how it looks at the, like how it seems from far away, how it seems from up close. Even if how it seems from far away conflicts with how it seems up close. Up close it looks like it's moving, far away it seems like it's not moving, so it contains its own contradictions. That's unsettling. Maybe Xenophanes was right. All this shit is beyond our understanding. Like, you can't make sense of it. It's incoherent. And that's why philosophy only lasted for 100 years. <laughs> we were like, oh, the world's a mystery. Like, we think we can make it make sense. No, nope, it can't make sense. All right, back to the old gods. Any other lingering questions on Heraclitus? He will come back up again. We're going to continue to talk about Heraclitus. We're going to talk about him in distinction to, uh, with, uh, with Parmenides. And we're going to see that come back again when we read Plato. And, and Plato specifically puts the two of them into dialogue with one another. Actually, not specifically. Heraclitus never gets mentioned once in Parmenides. But his ghost is just going like, ooh, like just running through the whole dialogue. <clears throat> Some more stuff here about Heraclitus that's totally worth talking about. In addition to the fact that like, he's got this aphoristic style, he speaks in riddles. We can talk a little more about like, what are these riddles, like, what, what's, what's going on with these riddles? What is, it, what is it like to read and work through them? And this might be different for different ones of us, but I tried to, I tried to highlight this when we were talking about some of the problems with Anaximander as well. When you get to this thing that's a little difficult, that's a little weird, when you get to this little linguistic puzzle, maybe just one little fragment, one little phrase where you're just like, what is going on there? It draws you in, right? If we're talking about you know, this thing that I talked about very early on in the class, that what we're looking for is to strike up a genuine conversation with the text. It is easy to get engaged with something that is as obscure and peculiar as the fragments of Heraclitus. Some of them are, 
Some of them are, are, are real gems. It's interesting to see them right next to each other. For example, he says things like, well-reasoned discourse is common to all men. And then he'll turn right around and say, yeah, like, the Logos proves incomprehensible to all. Wait, is it a common faculty to all, or is it incomprehensible to all? Heraclitus says, listen not to me, but to the Logos. Listening not to me, but to the Logos, it, it is wise to see that everything is one. This is the first time we've had the Logos, by the way, too. Heraclitus is first on the scene with not just talking about like a Logos, an account. He talks about the Logos. We can think of this in a, in a way we see that the... the, the term itself starting to change its shape, and now it's starting to talk about not just like your perspective on things or an account, it's a coherent account. If we listen to the Logos, if we listen to like speech insofar as it is coherent and doesn't contradict itself, we'll see things as they really are. Listening to the Logos, not to me. And this is a faculty that's common to all, all humans have the faculty of like being able to listen to the Logos, speak the same language as the Logos. But but they don't, right? What is it that he says? Of the Logos, which is as I describe it, Men always prove to be uncomprehending, both before they have heard it and once they have heard it. What's going on here? He says, listen not to me, but to the Logos. And if you do, you'll be wise and you'll see everything is one. This is a faculty that's common to all. And by common to all, speaking of the Logos as I have been, everybody finds it incomprehensible. Is this real wisdom? Is he just fucking with us here? What's going on here? Like, is, 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 is this a game? Is it like, maybe they're not all from Heraclitus. Maybe one day he was like, yeah, the log, like, the, you're sure the world makes sense. And the next day somebody's like, hey, what about the logos, Heraclitus? And he's just like, no sense, makes no sense at all. He's just, he's just fickle like that, like a Greek god. What's going on here? Yeah. Yeah, that's true. Although the moon is like something that like everybody can see, right? But it's also incomprehensible, like logos. Point B, this is what's important. That's what's important. Ah, yes, I see. So listen not to me, but to the logos. So maybe what he's saying here is that like, look, I'm I'm mangling this. I'm like any other mortal human, and I can only speak in contradictions. But through those contradictions, you might be able to you might be able to hear the logos. Hear me, but don't listen to me. Listen to the Logos that's like, it's speaking through me in code, perhaps. I, this is why people write dissertations on this guy, just because like, even one little fragment, you're just like, I could do a chapter on that thing. Just goes on and on and on. It's a little mechanism that just keeps giving. If you stick with it, if you actually bother to interrogate the text, yes. but nobody does it. Including Heraclitus, or is he the one exception? Oh, I can't really tell. Yeah. Know. Tough, yeah. There's that everyone. Yeah. Is that, that's, that's problematic, yeah. Maybe it goes back to what Zenobli says, that it's beyond our understanding, that everyone is capable of understanding that they don't understand it. Everything is capable of understanding that they don't understand. Maybe this is like, listen to Heraclitus, and the Logos will speak. And what it says is, I'm incomprehensible. Maybe. Yeah. I was just thinking maybe he's, like, if he truly believes that everything has changed, maybe he speaks so vaguely so that the understanding of what he says can be different over time. So that also would change. But listening not to me, but to the Logos, wise men will see that all is one, not a whole lot of different perspectives. 
So we contradict, like, surprise, Heraclitus contradicted himself. So yeah, which would it be? Uh, is this an invitation to get, like, all perspectives? Or is it that, like, there's only one truth? I have a feeling some of the dissertations on Heraclitus were <laughs> that, yeah. I wouldn't be surprised. Funny guy, right? Not, not funny like Jerry Seinfeld funny guy. Funny like that guy on the bus smells funny funny guy. <clears throat> or maybe, yeah, maybe, yeah, maybe like ha-ha funny. <clears throat> strange, strange fellow. One of my favorite fragments from Heraclitus is... Uh, is Fusus Cryptesthi file. Nature loves to hide. Brings us right back. Like we've, this is territory we've been in before. Nature loves to hide. This is the nature of nature, that it loves to hide itself. Is that... If, I, if that's true and I know that, do I know the nature of nature? Loves, yeah, so this might be like if it loves to hide. That doesn't mean it can't be found, but you gotta you gotta look, yeah. at least, right? You gotta listen to the logos. You gotta look for nature because it loves to hide itself. When you find it, it's but when you find it, you say like, or maybe it's just still hiding, right? When you when you encounter it and you're like incomprehensible, then maybe we say like, well, that's because nature loves to hide. You gotta keep looking. It's there deep inside the contradictions. Although I gotta be honest, I thought that the whole point of this project of philosophy was to make things a little bit clearer, to help us understand things. And with Heraclitus, I'm not sure if we're there. We have some like really provocative riddles, fun things to go round and round with, lots of stuff to chew on, but I don't know how much nutrition there is in there. What's that? It's like celery. Yeah, I was thinking like grizzle or, or something like that. You chew and chew and chew, but like you never, you never stop chewing. But yeah, maybe like, I don't know. I, I, I don't want to sell Heraclitus short. I, I really like him. I think there's a lot of really cool stuff going on here. But I do wonder at the end of the day, this is a problem that philosophy has. Sometimes it's hard to tell the difference between wisdom and just kind of willful obscurity. Folks will say things that sound real deep. And you'll be like, whoa. On close inspection, like, wait, that doesn't make any sense. If my neighbor said the things that Heraclitus did, I'd, I'd be like, what a dumbass. <laughs> Heraclitus says it, and I'm like, well, maybe there's some wisdom in that. Am I being too charitable to Heraclitus? Am I being not charitable enough to my neighbor? The best that I can get from Heraclitus is that the Logos is incomprehensible and nature loves to hide itself. I'm not sure if that moves the ball forward at all. Yeah? Um, I wish there were more fragments, but I'm glad that there are as many as there are. Because some of these are real people and asshole. Yeah, the dark philosopher, right, yeah. That's uh, illuminating when you, uh, to sort of think at it to a capital view. Anything in particular? Yes. And whenever a philosopher does speak of the common people, it's, it's hardly ever complimentary. Yeah. And if somebody has that sort of disdain, I think that they are going to be willful, uh, willfully obscuring things and making people come to them uh, more so than just speaking clearly. So he's going to go to try to be a little bit confusing and try to be um, a bit out. Is it a rhetorical, a rhetorical strategy? A rhetorical um, a rhetorical strategy to like be obscure, to kind of like make your point seem a little shiny, so somebody will be like, "Ooh, what's going on here?" It's the it's like one of the things that you can do to guarantee that somebody's going to pay, pay pay close attention enough to what you're saying, that some thinking can happen. Maybe, maybe it's a rhetor That's certainly what like folks like Nietzsche and Hegel seem to think. Yeah. Maybe to understand like incomprehensible 
logic like that is to bring more incomprehensible logic to it. We'll fight fire with fire? Yeah, like, uh, you, you know how he says, like, it's uh, Logos is incomprehensible. We kind of understand that. We understand the ununderstanding. But what if, like, what if everybody's different, what if everybody has a different understanding of the un, uh, in understanding? God, that just sounds so stupid. But like everybody has, <laughs> everybody has a different perspective? Everybody has a different uh, perspective that they don't understand that one thing, and maybe that's why it hides itself so well, because everybody's different. Because everybody's, mis everybody's missing it, but everybody's missing it in a slightly different way? Yes, exactly. That's certainly possible. It is one way, though, right? There's, like how, there's how the world and the cosmos is, mm -hmm. and then there's like what we think of it. And they're two different things, though, right? So this is, this, we're starting to, like, this is sprouting up as a theme also, right? Something that's running through all of the philosophers. This idea that, like, it seems like the world is a certain way. It seems like it seems one way to us, and that there's a gap, right? Mm -hmm. That there's this, this issue of, like, how things seem to us aren't exactly the way that they are. And we have to, like, interrogate this relationship between how things seem and how they are. That's how we understand it. How we understand. Ooh, ooh. But I'm not sure if I would go so far as to say how we understand. Or I would put a big asterisk by how we understand it. Yeah. Because in order for me to say, like, how I understand it, I it's might want to require that I actually understand it. Right? There's, like, the way I understand things, and I might say something like, there is no way I understand things. Not right now. Not today. Today I understand very little of this. I might talk about how things seem to me but I might stop short of saying there's a way that I understand them just because I can't cobble it all together into one big coherent whole, which is how I would imagine that like, this is how the Logos would tell the story, right? Coherently. No contradictions. Yes? You mind if I read that out like just because I got the microphone? Yeah, so it's fragment five, right? Fragment five. fragment five of the Logos, which is, as I describe it, men always prove to be uncomprehending, both before they have heard it and once they have heard it. And just to pause right there, I got to be honest, like, I can't blame people for finding it incomprehensible when you look at the rest of what Heraclitus says and, and then, like, he has the nerve to be like, Whenever I tell people the truth, they're like, they don't comprehend it. And I'm like, that's because you're speaking in riddles, man. For although all things happen according to this logos, men are like people of no experience, even when they experience such words and deeds as I explain. When I distinguish each thing according to its constitution and declare how it is, but the rest of men fail to notice what they do after they wake up, just as they forget what they do when asleep. That maybe, like, it seems like maybe, like, they might hang in there long enough to, like, during the conversation be like, I hear what you're saying. Has this ever happened to you, by the way? My guess is it's happened to you many times. Might happen to you in just a couple of minutes where you're listening to somebody talking and you're just like, yeah, 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 yeah. And then they stop and go away and somebody's like, what was that all about? And you're like, well, it was... hmm. <laughs> where did it go? I just had it. Seems to maybe, like, according to that fifth fragment, Heraclitus is saying, like, even when they can stick around during the conversation, afterwards, it's like, it's like people who woke up from a dream and just forget the dream. This is an interesting um, image also to play around with, the difference between dreaming and waking. I'm talking about the difference between how things seem and the way that they are. Dreaming and waking is another another provocative one to work through. Descartes made a lot of big fuss out of it in the first meditation. Lots of philosophers have gone on to like use this dream metaphor. Parmenides is going to talk about a dream metaphor. He's going to be carried by, by the goddess on a chariot beyond the gates of night and day to a dream place or maybe a dead place. That'll be the, the next thing that we read. Um, just how we're sitting or question? Okay. Sometimes people sit with like one hand like this, and I'm never sure what to make of it. Um, let's go here and then here. Jonathan, it's Jonathan, right? Tom. Tom. 
I was so close. Tom. Um, so I, I kind of see there being a line, uh, starting with uh, Anaximander's Apron, going into the Xenophon, and then going into Xenophon, and then going into Heraclitus. Yeah. Heraclitus, sure. I mean, um, it, we, could, we could make sure that we're all pronouncing it in perfect Attic Greek, but that would be silly. Um, so sort of a common theme I see with all of them is not being able to find the truth, but only sort of kind of getting there by subtraction. Like, the truth is a bullseye of a target, and huh. you can't hit it. But if you fire enough arrows, you'll hit everything but it, and then you can see. So you can say, like, so what I meant was, like, n where all those arrows didn't go. Yeah. That's one way to think about it. Another way to think about it, which is, like, really, really close, is that what we might be starting to do, whether anybody knows it or not, and Heraclitus is starting to give us some conceptual tools for thinking of it this way, we could imagine a kind of a logical space of possibility. All of the positions that could possibly be taken about something. In this case... What the cosmos, what the ordering principle of the cosmos is, what the fundamental principle behind reality is, and everybody's taken a stab at it, and they're mapping the territory of all of the possible positions that can be taken. If you're curious, like, what if I decide to like think about it as one material? The Milesians got there and they scattered it. They didn't make perfect. They were like Lewis and Clark. They got out there and they were like, all right, there's like a mountain over here and then there's some water over here. Bailey's was like, yeah, the water. And um, <laughs> Xenophanes gives us some idea of like, what if you wanted to, if like we're in monism land and like you want to go to Theologyville, here's what it's going to look like. If you want to go to like Math Town, Pythagoras and the Pythagoreans are all over that. Well, I'm, now suddenly we have this, it's almost as if Heraclitus like came through some mountain pass and there was this huge territory where he's just like, change and identity over time is like going on here, but I have no idea what the map looks like. In fact, he like comes back and reports to everybody that like, there's crazy, there's like, there's like horses that are birds and like all kinds of just like, it's bananas over here. And the best that he can do is talk about like how crazy thinking about change is. But he's he's kind of he's mapping out the territory, or he's inviting us to come and and like check out what it's like as well. So we can think of it this way. So this is maybe we're doing a process of elimination. Like that's not the answer. That's not the answer. That's not the answer. We can also think of this in terms of all of the logical possible spaces that like, we can occupy on this. Some of them might be problematic. Some of them might be self-contradictory. Some of them might conflict with the way that the world actually is. Which is the sort of thing that eventually we'll figure out, right? This is, this is a problem for all of the ancient thinkers, is that like, they're working with a, what, fifth century BCE understanding of the world? they're going to get a lot of stuff wrong. Aristotle, who's one of my faves, big, big time faves. I had a professor, my Aristotle teacher once said, Aristotle's not wrong about anything. He's only incomplete in a couple of places. And I'm like, well, he was kind of wrong about women and kind of wrong about slavery. And there's some stuff about physics that he's like dead. We're not even close right about. But you almost get the impression that like, some of these folks, if you brought them along, if you kind of like gave them all of the insights of modern life, that they would be able to incorporate them and they'd be like, oh, okay, all right, I see, all right. No, I'll change my theory a little bit here. I'm not so sure about Heraclitus. He might still be an asshole. <laughs> he might still be that guy in the corner who's just like, what if things are the way they aren't? And we'll be like, what, what, what? No, they can't. And that's what Parmenides is going to start us with. Parmenides is going to start us with this idea that things can't be how they aren't. Everybody's packing up. Well, I'm not done yet. <laughs> things can't be how they aren't. Stanton. Um, so on the subject of him kind of being a, you know, Jerk. irritable asshole. Yeah. Uh, the Dictator of the 48th fragment, uh, I think, actually shows a level of respect for at least one other person. Shall I read it since I have the microphone? Sure. All right. So in the 48th fragment, Heraclitus says, the Ephesians... Oh, Heraclitus is from Ephesus, by the way, or Ephesus. Uh, shall we put him on the map? All right. Um, 
<clears throat> I think I've got this right. Xenophanes is from Colophon up here, and then Ephesus down here is Heraclitus. Got it, quite the cluster going over here off the coast of Turkey, right? Even if we're like, yeah, Pythagoras was really from here, like there's serious action. We're going to come over here for our next one. Pythagoras and, Z uh, sorry, Parmenides and Zeno are going to be over here, the Italians again. But um, so, sorry, the Ephesians would do well to hang themselves. These are his towns, these are like the people in his community. The Ephesians would do well to hang themselves, every adult man, and leave their city to adolescence, since they expelled her moderus, the worthiest man among them, saying, let's not have even one worthy man, but if we do, let him go elsewhere and live among others. This is, yeah, maybe this is Heraclitus as, at his nicest. Namely to, to the person who was, yeah, to her moderus. I don't know. Good question. Look it up. Apparently he was a good guy who was exiled. Yep. So put simply, this like trying to understand this is kind of like digging for gold knowing that there's no gold. Oh, I don't know if I would say that there's no gold just yet. Mm. It's, I didn't say that it wasn't. It's like, yeah. We've taken one, two, three, four, five. We've taken six stabs at it. That's a little premature. Like if, if I was... If I was starting a gold mine, a gold mine, and I like a gold mine. Oh, yeah, no. Yeah. If I was starting a gold mine, and on the fr first six tries, I was like, "There's no gold." You'd be like, "Well, there might be gold. You so just haven't it? found it yet." Um, yeah. Yeah. All right. All right, Socrates. We'll we'll do that. <clears throat> um, There's a great Louis C.K. bit about uh, kids wide painting, about how like you know like sometimes sometimes somebody will like see a kid with a parent and the parent looks exhausted. You know this bit, and like the the kid is just like, "Mommy, why is the sky blue?" And the parents just shut up and eat your French fries. And he's like, "Some people look at this and they're just like, why doesn't the parent answer their engage the child and answer their question?" And he's like, "That's because you can't. You can't do it with a kid. They just keep." coming with the whys, and he walks through an exchange with his daughter that starts with, why can't we go outside and play? And the answer that he gives is, because it's raining. And she says, why? And he says, because water's falling from the sky. Why? Because it was in a cloud. Why? Because clouds form when there's vapor. What's vapor? Sure, yeah, when there's vapor. Why? And then he tries to cut her off, and he's just like, I don't know. I don't know. Those are all the things I know. I don't know any more things. <laughs> Why? Because I didn't pay attention in school. Why? Because I was high all the time. <laughs> Why? Because my parents, and he, he just like runs, and at some point he says, I'm going to like kind of abridge this for you because like it's just, it gets so weird and abstract. And eventually at the end of this bit, what he comes to is, his daughter says, why? And he goes, look, because some things are and some things are not. And she goes, why? And he goes, because <laughs> things that are not can't be. That makes no sense. You can't have things that are aren't thing and things that aren't are. It doesn't make any sense. This is a wonderful little illustration of exactly like what can happen in a Y chain, possibly the difference between a philosopher and a child, where the child doesn't want answers. They just want attention, perhaps. But the most amazing thing about this is where he ends up. Because some things are and some things aren't, and things that are not can't be. This is the only premise, I would argue, it's the only premise that Parmenides needs for his poem. That's going to be your next reading. And we're going to see what can we spin out of this premise that says there are things that are and there are things that are not, and the things that are not can't be. That's it. See you guys later.